20 seconds, guys. Your backpack off, man. Stay a while. We'll be here two hours. Well, an hour and 57 minutes. There it is. Cool. So what are some of the ways we see mobilization of the home front? Ross, please go for it. Um, businesses change their possessions to create more materials like or thousand percent, right? Businesses change their production. That's a big deal. I'll come to you. That's a full example of total war. Where no longer is your economy focusing on consumer goods for people to buy. And instead, your economy is focusing on producing stuff for the war effort. Huge shift. Huge shift. All right, a lot of that's done by the Office of War Production. Yes, Ramos? Propaganda motivated Pro people to work in factories every day. Propaganda motivating not just like fear or contributing to war bonds, but also to go to work in factories. That their job matters, right? I just wrote a test question about that. About propaganda that people feel like their job matters at home. Cool, good job. Uh, Sarah, give me another one. Uh, women working. Huge, huge mobilization shift. Absolutely. Carla, what do you have? Um, more government involvement in the sense of fashion and Jesus, Jesus, like the connection. Jesus Christ, yes. More government, you say involvement? Involvement. Government, well, even more so than the New Deal, with their hands on more things. Rationing, she said. The War Production Board. Absolutely. The government telling companies what they can and can't produce for the war effort. Those things that got FDR in trouble during the New Deal are now totally okay because we're fighting Nazis. Excellent. Um, Jesus, give me another one. I want to say uh, the Pearl Harbor just being a motivation to keep fighting. Okay. Yeah. Public opinion, right? They, like using Pearl Harbor as a motivator, to Jonathan's point about propaganda, to fuel public opinion for the war. That's home front. Home fronty. Dominguez, anything else? Mm, I think the draft or even Yes, the, or even during wartime, right? The draft. To say, congratulations, you're now a member of the army. Congratulations, you're now a member of the army. Congratulations, you're now a member of the army. By drafting soldiers, is that a continuity of wartime or a change? It's a continuity. What other wars do we draft in? Civil War and World War I. Good. Sure, so it, but it doesn't mean it's not mobilization. It's a call. We've been drafting in wars for a long time, but it still is an exact example of motor mobilization. I'm asking about change, mobilization. Good. Uh, we'll do one more, and it will come from Josh. Um, so the job, like, uh, they encourage uh, people to like, they kind of like uh, push agendas through like propaganda. They push agendas such as uh, like victory gardens. Oh, victory gardens, absolutely. Like a rationing and selling bonds. Selling bonds, huge deal, right? With with uh, what's his name, Bugs Bunny? Any bonds today? Yeah. Okay. So pushing pushing agendas through public opinion. Good. Uh, we talked a little yesterday, the tail end of the class, about Japanese internment. All right. This question of like, is it cool for the government to limit civil rights during wartime? And up to this point. Has it been cool in other wars to limit civil liberties during wartime? Yeah. I'm asking if you agree or not. Has, has, has the Supreme Court agreed that it's cool? Yes. So in World War II, we have Korematsu versus the U.S., where the Supreme Court says, like, yeah, that sucks, Japanese people, but it's war. All right, go back to World War I. We have Shank versus the U.S., Deb, bless you, Debs versus the U.S. It's on your test as well. Shank versus the U.S. is one of the cases on your test. Uh, that... The Supreme Court says, yeah, sorry, you can lose the freedom of speech during wartime to criticize the government. Go back to the Civil War at Lincoln and habeas corpus. Yes, there's a continuity that the government always limits civil rights during wartime, but opportunities also expand during wartime for some marginalized groups. Marginalized groups in this case, such as who? Lady Vargas. Who are some of the marginalized groups that get new opportunities? Marginalized groups in society. Oh. Who gets new opportunities because of the war? You said it first. No, no. Go ahead. Women, black people, labor unions, Mexicans. 
Yeah. Who doesn't get opportunities in this case? The Japanese. So uh, all these women that are working, all these African Americans that leave the South, the Great Migration is super important in World War II because it breaks sharecropping, leads to the Civil Rights Movement after World War II, the Double V Campaign. African Americans pushing for their civil rights. Yeah, we'll fight this war for democracy abroad, but we're also going to fight it for democracy at home. Cool. Cool, cool. So today we're talking about America in World War II. The victory, those of you that don't know, uh, the Allies win World War II. That's why we're not speaking German or Japanese. Um, the win, why they won, why that matters, and then what is the impact going forward. Uh, it's the last day of period seven. Congratulations. You have one unit left after today at A push. That's it. You have like, counting Wednesdays, like eight or nine more days of A push. That's nuts. And you're done. Right, I can remember you guys sitting down for your period two test on colonization. 80% of you bombing it. And then look where we are now. Only 70% of you bombed your period seven test. So we've changed life for 10% of you. Congratulations. I'm kidding, you guys have come a long way. But think, August 8th we started, and you guys are like, oh my god, this is going to be such a long year, and so much homework, and so much homework, I did it last night, I'm so tired. It's true. <laughs> and you've learned nothing from that, because now you're all tired again today, because you did your homework last night at, at 2, 3 in the morning? 3 30? 5? So, uh, here's today. today's our key concept, and it's a super important key concept for what it means for the future. World War II transforms American society. It really does. The combination of World War II and the New Deal, back to back, really do transform American society to a way more active, hands-on, involved, large, big government. We never again go back to that government of the 20s, of hands-off, mind our own business, no regulations, leave everybody alone. We never go back. So that's what happens at home. Well, the victory of the US and its allies vaults the US into a position of global, political, and military leadership. So this is the time when America switches from, with a couple little bouts of involvement, like imperialism, World War I, and then back to isolationism, then back to isolationism, then back to isolationism. This is the time when the U.S. never again goes back to isolationism. World War II is that linchpin for our, our role in the world, from minding our own business to a much larger role. It's, our, it's a linchpin turning point for the role of government in our lives at home from no role to a large role. So that combination of the 30s and 40s, Great Depression, New Deal, World War II wise, really is that huge turning point of our second semester. This is it. The turning point of the first semester was the Civil War, from fighting about slavery to slavery being over. The linchpin turning point of our second semester is right here, of, of hands-off government to fully hands-on regulatory welfare share government, from minding our business internationally to being involved heavily with other countries' affairs. And you could argue for better or worse. There's some better. There's some worse. There's a lot of worse. There's more worse. There's a lot of worse. But it's a huge turning point in terms of like where we're going as a class and where America goes. So here's your prompt. It's a very basic one, but I would like us to write it today. So Diana, can you read it first, please? Evaluate the extent to which World War II transforms American society. Yeah. How much does it transform American society? From what to what? From what to what? From what to what? You can look at this as either causation or continuity and change. Depending on how you want to read it. And let's go. So today, we will talk about the following seven things. As long as we play our cards right, you guys stay productive, proactive, and on point with me. We'll watch a 48-minute video at the end of class. So let's get this done quick, right to the point. You can watch a video on the home front of World War II which does a really good job explaining the production and the Japanese part, everything else that really, really matters. So let's get cracking. You guys with me? Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, before I forget, because I'm probably going to go right to the end of class today, it's Thursday. It's my favorite day of the week, because I get to see some of you for, for six hours, right? Two hours of African American studies, two hours of A push, and two hours after school. Some of you. Um... So it's your last Thursday before the test. Uh, I'm going to pass out a brief skills-based study guide for you guys that's due Monday for the test. I'm trying to change things up a little bit because period seven is just so much to it. I don't want you to get overwhelmed in study guide questions. Rather, right to the point of things that I want you to know. So we can go, go over that after school today. You can ask for test hints after school today. 
You can clarify anything missing for your binder check after school today. Uh, but I promise I'll be here until at least 5.30 for you guys since I had to cut short the last couple of Thursdays for a parent-teacher night. Uh, and then last Thursday, I had to go to the airport to pick somebody up. Uh, so today, I promise I'll be here until at least 5.30. We'll take care of our business. We can play no cards if you want. Let's get ourselves ready for Monday uh, in, in the fullest, most fulfilling way possible. Cool? And then Thursdays going forward, I'm going to add a little more structure to, to, to focus on our writing skills, our, our recall skills. Maybe we'll do like a period two review on a Thursday afternoon, get real wild. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, your next boot camp is scheduled for March 17th. That's a little ways away. A little ways away. A couple weeks. Cool? Questions, comments, concerns? You good, Vargas? Yeah. Let's get cracking. So today I'm going to talk about, uh, we're going to take a step back in time to uh, when the U.S. is trying to stay out of the war, but how they prepare anyway. Picking up the end of our lecture from Monday. Uh, the second thing is important because it's in the College Board framework in terms of what we're fighting for versus what we're fighting against. Uh, what's motivating this ideological fight? We'll look at Pearl Harbor. And de the declaration of war from there, we'll look again, even though we did a little yesterday because it still really matters, to uh, the war effort and how production fuels the victory. There's a one thing to learn today and yesterday, it is how U.S. industrial production is one of the huge reasons we win the war. We'll look at, very briefly, the war in the Atlantic and Europe. We'll look a little more in depth at the war in the Pacific. And then we'll look at costs and legacies, and then we'll get out of here. So back to my point from Monday, the U.S. is neutral, but are they actually neutral? No, no. no. They passed those neutrality acts in 35, 36, and 37 that do, in fact, keep us neutral. Congress is saying, you will not trade with a country at war. Don't do it, because that's what got us in trouble last time. We're trading with England, trading with France, trying to trade with both sides. Our ships are getting sunk. It's all sorts of bad. And by the time we really start seeing what's happening in Europe, who Hitler really is, who Mussolini really is, we realize and maybe we can support one side over the other. Maybe those guys are better than those other guys. Right? Whereas World War I was a huge mess, mess of like this alliance and that alliance, and this country sucks, but that country also sucks, but that country, what? Who's that guy? Um, in this case, we know who the good guy and the bad guy is, we just don't want to fight. The Cash and Carry Act is really what pulls us out of the Depression in great numbers. Uh, because it allows other countries to buy stuff from us on what two conditions? Vargas. Some cash. Yes, that's in the title. They have to, they have to pay for it up front instead of? Loans. Instead of loans. Yeah, good. And then? They have to carry it themselves. Yeah, they got to take it back themselves. So that way our ships aren't involved, our banking and loans isn't involved, since that's what got us in the Great Depression in the first place, partially. Um, and so that way we're going to start fueling the war for England, for the USSR to a smaller extent, for Australia, for New Zealand, for other smaller allied countries that we're trying to support. But by 1940, FDR gets reelected for the third time. Well, I guess reelected for the second time, elected for the third time. I'm going to be precise in my language. Uh, and then he passes the Selective Service Act of 1940, the first ever peacetime draft. So you could say that these two things really start ramping up our preparedness for the war, still without us getting really involved in the war. Finally, we make a deal with England in 1940. It's called the Destroyer for Bases Deals. We trade them a bunch of our old warships, which we don't need to use anymore anyway because they're old, in exchange for a bunch of military bases in the Atlantic. So this is us basically trading materials for land, materials for military bases. And by that point, it's quite clear who we're supporting. France has fallen by this point, because France always falls. It's true. Uh, so all that's left in Europe is the USSR, who's of course communist, so we don't really like them. But they're an enemy of our enemy, and therefore they're kind of our friend. Uh, and England, who's getting bombed every night by the German Air Force. Here is, again, Dr. Seuss calling our policies hypocritical. Right, we have the neutrality acts, and then the aid that will win, and it keeps pulling away and pulling away and pulling away, demonstrating that over, eventually that's going to pull us off of this tree into the ocean. However, there is still a huge chunk of isolationists in the United States society that don't want to get involved. Let me tell you because I'll help you on, on uh, Monday. The chief isolationist is the head or the spokesman of this America First Committee. 
is Charles Lindbergh. He's a celebrity. He's a pilot. He's the first man to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean in a plane by himself, which sounds miserable. How do you go pee? Don't answer that question. And he's famous, and he's the one pushing this idea of we should stay isolationist. But there is still a huge chunk of America that agrees with him. In general, these isolationists are in the Midwest. These Iowas, Nebraskas, the middle of the country. They're like, Japan? I don't know where Japan is. I'm in Iowa. They are very rural, and they are more conservative. The Senate has a committee called the Nye Committee, which is headed by Senator Nye. And they are arguing that the only reason we were in World War I in the first place was to benefit our manufacturers of weapons. The only reason we were in that war in the first place was to get rich off of it, so we shouldn't do the same thing for, for World War II. And that's fueling some public opinion that's against the war. But the really the important committee you should know is the America First Committee, who want to just avoid any entanglements with any European problem, and they want to stay isolationist. Now, most of America pre-Pearl Harbor is cool with staying neutral. They like supporting England. They don't like the Nazis. They don't like the Japanese, but they don't want to go fight the war. So they like this arrangement. We're getting rich, but we're not dying. And that's a good situation in life. But I'm doing neither of those things. I am dying and I'm not getting rich. Um, so they like this situation. They like the fact that we're supporting the good guys, but they don't want to actually get involved in the war. Up until Pearl Harbor. Up until Pearl Harbor. That kind of changes things. Once you get attacked, it's like, eh, it's going to hurt the isolationists now. We just died. So before we get involved, we have this policy of appeasement, which you should have covered at great length last year, where Japan invades part of China, and everybody says... Don't do that. <laughs> Japan's like, you gonna punish me? No, but don't do that thing. Germany does the same thing for much of Europe, in the Sudetenland, in the Rhineland, and we're like, Hitler, Hitler, stop it, stop, stop it, stop it. And he's like, yeah, cool. Let me get right on that as he goes and invades another country. So. Italy invades Ethiopia, Japan invades both Manchuria and China, Germany remilitarizes the Rhineland, they invade the Sudetenland, and our response is basically just that. Stop it! Don't do that thing. It's bad. But I took my dog, like barks, another dog was walking by, and I'm like, don't do that. And he's like, all right, cool. Goes back outside, the next dog that walks by, Arr! I told you not to do that. He's like, I don't care what you say, I'm a freaking dog. <laughs> Hitler's like, I don't care what you say, I'm a freaking militarist dictator, I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. <laughs> the global response is this Munich conference, which they all get together and Hitler says, yeah, you're right, you're right, I'm done, nobody worry, nobody panic, I'm done invading other countries. I just wanted, I just wanted Germany's land that we had before war that we lost. Right, the uh, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain comes back to England, Proclaimed as a hero, he, he avoided World War II. He says, we will see peace in our time because of this conference. And Hitler goes back to Germany, he's like, ha, 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 that guy's a dumbass. <laughs> uh, one year later, uh, Germany invades Poland, a fully neutral, hardly armed Poland, who has, like, it's like the South pre-Civil War, like 18 donkeys, a horse, and six guns. A Germany role shows up with uh, a crazy amount of tanks and soldiers, and uh, Poland falls in about six to eight minutes. Uh, and then World War II has begun, showing again that appeasement was a great strategy. I would, I would compare appeasement to like all of our compromises over slavery. Like, yeah, cool, Missouri Compromise, we got a line now, don't cross that line. Compromise 1850, Kansas-Nebraska Act, Dred Scott, Fugitive Slave. These things don't in general work. It's like avoiding your problems, like you guys in your grades right now. <laughs> On the other side of the ocean, we have the Japanese. We start publishing a ton of anti-Japanese propaganda, which I argue looks a little bit like Jonathan Ramos. <laughs> um, but it's this idea of yellow, yellow peril. We're scared of yellow Japan. 
Japan is being very aggressive. It's actually more publicized in America than the Nazis because the Germans are white. So we're like, well, they're white people. So they're doing bad things, but white people. Whereas the Japanese are Japanese and they are therefore not white people. Uh, and we look at their, ad their actions as way more savage and barbaristic. Uh, and our, our attitude is very anti-Japan. By 1939, the U.S. stops the sale of any petroleum, oil, and scrap metal to Japan. Two things that we actually export in pretty large numbers in Japan, we stop selling those things to them. But those are two things that you need in any war machine. What do you need petroleum for? Oil for tanks. Tanks. Yeah, J Japan has a lot of tanks, don't they? And they're tiny island. They're ships. There we go. Thank you. Ships don't float. I mean, tanks don't float too. Uh, planes, ships, their war machine, and scrap metal to build the same things. Now, Japan is a small island without these things as natural resources. They need petroleum, they need metal. Where are they going to get them now? They use that as, in a sense, this launching point to start taking other islands in the Pacific where they can get those resources. Their thinking is, well, the U.S. is a little busy with their whole Great Depression thing, and the U.S. is kind of ignoring their colony in the Philippines, so we can do whatever we want in the Pacific, and we'll be left alone. They're not wrong. We kind of look the other way. <coughs> After they signed an agreement with Italy and Germany, we banned more items from them because we see them as now part of this war machine of the Nazis and the Italians, which is all sorts of bad. By 1940, we've also taken other islands in the Pacific. And by July of 1941, we have frozen all of their assets, which means any money they have in U.S. banks, any agreements they have with U.S. companies, those are all stopped. In a sense, by July of 1941, have we declared war on Japan? What kind of war? Yeah, we've declared economic war on Japan by 1941. This is largely what we're trying to do in North Korea today, is keep them from accessing finances and resources they need to advance their, their nuclear agenda. We've done the same thing in Japan by July of 1941. We've embargoed all of their trade so they can get nothing from us. And they can't sell anything to us either, which is we're a big importer of their goods. It's because they've taken over Indochina, the old French colony that will become, any guesses? Vietnam. Vietnam. Now, they've taken over Indochina, and we think that's ours to take over. We'll do that later. They've taken over Vietnam. So we see that as an aggress aggressive act against one of our allies, the French, and then we, call, we stop all trade and support of them whatsoever. Cool. So by 1941, before we are either even involved in the war, we have our war aim set out for us. As I told you on Monday, we passed the Lend-Lease Act, which updates the cash and carry policy to more of an approach of, yeah, we'll let you borrow it, and yes, we'll even ship it for you. Much more of a pre-World War I policy. Because by now, it looks a little dire. It looks a little terrible. It looks a little dangerous. Great Britain is the last real ally friend of ours in Europe standing, so we'll get whatever they need to them on credit, and we'll stay neutral but very pro-British in our neutrality. We meet with the British in 1941, FDR and Winston Churchill, and the Atlantic Charter, and we start discussing what we want to do after the war. Are we in the war yet? We're not in the war militarily. Are we in the war economically? Yeah. Absolutely. Are we in the war in terms of public opinion? Yeah, because everyone's pro-British in this agreement. They say that after the war, we're going to promote self-determination and free trade. See, that sounds familiar. Democracy, freedom of the seas, free trade, nobody should pursue any territorial expansion, no colonization, and we're going to have a UN, a United Nations group of nations together to enforce this. Who would have agreed with this? Wilson. Wilson. But he had a stroke, so, you know, he, he stroked. Yes, this is very uh, 14 points tr uh, non-treaty for side, League of Nations-esque. And now the U.S. is finally realizing that was probably a better idea in the first place. Wilson knew. A lot of America knew. But we're so worried about foreign entanglements that everyone returns to isolationism. This map shows us where this aid, lend leasewise is going. The fatter the arrow, the more aid. So you can see we're supporting Great Britain heavily. Russia to a smaller extent. India and the Indian Ocean nations over here, some. South Africa, a tick. Australia, New Zealand, and China as well. So all the countries not named 
Japan, Germany, Italy, Spain. So these things demonstrate that we are really engaged in an in a ideological war for democracy, for freedom, before we're even involved in the war at all in the first place. Further, FDR gives a very, very famous speech called FDR's Four Freedoms, which he gives via fireside chat, via radio to the American people before the war, we were even actually involved in the war. So that's very, I'll give you a really short excerpt because I'm going to go with a lot to cover today. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you three minutes to read that and simply tell me, according to FDR, what are we fighting for? Not what we're fighting against, what we're fighting for. Three minutes, read it out, go. Go. Sorry. Okay. Read it and tell me. Second page. All right, take 30 seconds, talk to your partner real quick. What are we fighting for? What is America making a stand that these are the things we're fighting for? 30 seconds, go. All right, let's break this down. Uh, Maioli, what are we fighting for? Summarize it, categorize it for me. What do we, what do we believe in here? Yeah, having different opinions. Reasonable. I like that. Uh, Hector, what else? To worship God or any God. 
Yeah, right? The way it says, the freedom to worship however you see fit. Worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. Cool. Carla would also be fighting for it. Freedom of fear. Yeah, freedom what? From fear. From fear. The, the freedom for people in the world to live their life without fear. Fear of their government. Fear of what happens tomorrow. Right? I argue that's something that we're still fighting for today in 2018 America, depending on what social group we're talking about. And what else are we fighting for, Ventura? Um, he's just fighting, I mean, freedom from, like, want. So, like, from want. What does that mean to you? Like, greed, like, power hungry. Okay. Yeah, so that people can have what they need without, without inability to access it. So Norman Rockwell, a famous artist, uh, was commissioned to make these four into paintings. So he does. This guy is standing up in a town hall. I'm sorry, they're blurry. Uh, expressing his freedom of speech. We see a variety of people from different backgrounds, ages, colors, nationalities, worshiping in their own way. From want, with most Americans seen ever at Thanksgiving dinner, and freedom from fear. Sick children getting taken care of. So that's what we're fighting for. What we're fighting against are the ideals that are counter to this of fascism, with it totalitarianism, and militarism. So I want us to understand that it's an ideological struggle. Yes, it's us against the Nazis. Yes, it's good against bad. But it's also democracy against fascism. It's also capitalism versus totalitarianism. Except we're fighting with the communists. Don't tell anybody. Except it is this idea of good versus bad, us versus them, more so than any other global conflict in U.S. history, it's called the good war, or the necessary war, or the justified war. And this is before we even find out about the Holocaust, or find out about awful war crimes committed by the Japanese in China. So it's good versus bad, it's us versus them, it's, it's progress versus reversing to, to old ways of the world. Very important ideological struggle. So now we're actually get in the war. December 7th of 1941, Pearl Harbor is attacked, sneak attack by the Japanese. FDR gets on the radio like he's been doing since the start of his presidency with the Great Depression and says December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Surprise attack at Pearl Harbor. It's a very bold Japanese gamble. It's a risk for the Japanese, but it pays off greatly for them in the short term, not so hot for them in the long term. Ask Hiroshima. <laughs> uh, it, is a, it is a strike at the U.S. Navy in which they kill 188 of our aircrafts, our planes that are there, eight of our battleships, a bunch of other ships are sunk or crippled, and over 2,000 soldiers are dead. Sailors, excuse me. So it's very successful, but it would have been more successful if a bunch of our other ships hadn't been out at sea doing other things, practicing, training, doing whatever ships do out at sea. So a bunch of the really important ships are actually not at Pearl Harbor, which it would have been a much bigger effect for the Japanese except for that. Only 29 of the 350 planes are shot down, which shows how unprepared we were for this to take place. And this, as we try to recover from all of this, allows the Japanese to expand in the Pacific without us getting in the way. Without us getting in the way. Because now we don't have the, the manpower, the ship power, the plane power to stop them. So right after this, they go and take over the Philippines, which was our colony, which where we have military bases. We can't stop them because all of this necessary resources is gone at the bottom of the ocean. Our response is quite quick. We declare war on Japan the next day. In response, because they have that Tri-Patriot Act, that alliance in the Japanese, the Germans, and the Italians, Germany and Italy declare war on the U.S. on December 11th, three days later, and now we are fully engaged in the Second World War, and German U-boats immediately, now the war has been declared, their submarines begin attacking U.S. shipping immediately. They didn't want to bring, the Germans didn't want to bring us into the war, so once we're in the war, they're going to conduct the war as such. And they begin attacking our ships immediately. There is a, a time period of four to five months in which we can see German submarines from the U.S. coast. 
That's kind of terrifying. We don't think about these things today. Off the coast of New York City, German submarines. Off the coast of South Carolina and Florida. I should have done some attacks there. Uh, German submarines. In the Gulf of Mexico, off the coast of Texas and Louisiana, a huge presence of German submarines. And we do not yet have the capacity, naval-wise, to counter that, and a bunch of our ships just get sunk. Very early in the war, it doesn't look very good. But this is who we're fighting. Oh, don't you worry. I promised you two cartoons. So, here's your second cartoon. And not is game 
watch all year. I know. It's not racist at all either. <laughs> Christ. Uh, so it's important that we understand the way in which the U.S. of course mobilizes public opinion as we looked at yesterday and today uh, and also depicts at different times the Germans and the uh, Japanese as huge monsters. I don't let this swastika touch your kids. Buy war bonds. And also cartoonish losers. So in, in both cases, we're able to keep public opinion anti-German, anti-Japanese, to a much smaller extent anti-Italian, but since even in the movie it shows that, that Mussolini is just a, a big fat follow along for Hitler. Uh, so as the U.S. gets involved in the war, this is what we're facing. It's all bad. Right? As I pointed out to you right before the video clip, the German submarines are sinking our ships at a massive rate. There's not much we can do about it. We were prepared, but not prepared. The Nazis have rolled across all of Europe, all of mainland Europe, and are now getting a strong foothold in North Africa. The Japanese have captured all of the Pacific, up to and including the Philippines, to the point that they may be then attacking our ally of Australia. 
shortly. The U.S. forces are kicked out of the Philippines, our only big stronghold out of Hawaii in the Pacific. General Douglas MacArthur promises, I'll be back. I'm going to come back and kick your ass here in the Philippines, but just not yet. I was like, if I was bullying Jesus, and he's like, just wait, man. I'm going to go to the gym for three years. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to kick your ass. And that's Douglas MacArthur's way out of the Philippines. But 11,000 U.S. civilians and soldiers are taken as prisoners of war in the Philippines. They're taken on what's called the Bataan Death March, put into prisoner concentration-type camps, starved, beaten, tortured, killed. World War II was starting off really well for the Americans. Japan is at its peak of territorial control of the Pacific, and the Germans are at their peak of control of the Europe, mainland Europe. By the end of 42, it looks on the surface like the war is going to end in Nazi and Japanese victory. The Allies are facing defeat. All that's left is a, a shattered Great Britain, the U.S., who's just ramping up its war machine, and the USSR, who's still firing guns from 1887. Thank God the USSR has like 75 billion people. So they can just keep marching civilian after civilian after civilian into the war until hopefully the Nazis run out of bullets. All of these huge victories, however, that look really good on the surface, very Gilded Age-esque, are, are hiding a fatal weakness in the Axis war plan. Here's why. The Japanese and the Germans never get on the same page. They never decide to fight together. They never decide to fight the same war. Hitler doesn't like the Japanese. He doesn't. He's like, they're Japanese. They're not part of the master race. But Hitler thinks that they're going to be good to keep the U.S. preoccupied in, in the Pacific and therefore not attacking him. So they never coordinate, and that's a problem. They never coordinate strategies, and the early defeats also obscure the real strengths that the Allies have. They're going to be able to carry on for a long time. The two strengths are the manpower of the Soviet Union, the millions upon millions of people they can just throw into the war to have die, and the fact that the U.S. productive capacity has not even yet reached full peak war machine yet. The U.S. can't change its entire economy to a war economy until we're actually in the war. So it's not, it's not until December of 1941 that the U.S. is actually really turning their economy into a war economy. It's a semi-war economy. So it takes a little while for the economy to get rolling. It really is Hitler's fault. Hitler's fault for a lot of things. But Hitler's big mistake is always Germany's mistake. He decides to invade the Soviet Union. He wants to invade the Soviet Union because he's very anti-Bolshevism, anti-communism, anti-equality for all people, everybody's the same, community ownership. That's opposite of his master race ideology. So he signs a non-aggression pact with the Soviets early in the war, which thinks, makes the Soviets think, think they're, they're safe. But really the reality is he's like, I'm going to deal with the rest of Europe and then I'm going to deal with you later. He doesn't want to do the mistake of World War I and fight a war on two fronts. However, he gets, I don't know, antsy, impatient, and he decides in June of 41 to attack the Soviet Union, which is a gigantic military mistake. It's called Operation Barbarossa. He's going to use four million men, which is a lot of German soldiers. It's a lot of dudes, but it's nothing compared to what the Soviets have, because all they have is people, nothing else. Uh, and the line is super long. It's 2,000 miles long, and he's going to attack in three different offensives to try to take over, move on from, end Bolshevism, kill the Soviet Union. The Germans advance very quickly, but the farther they go, the farther they get from Germany. And that stretches their line out. So now they're farther from Germany, but then it's farther from their supplies, it's farther from their reinforcements, it's farther from their food, it's farther from their tanks, it's farther from their jackets. And then winter hits. It takes longer than Hitler thought. He invades in June. By the winter, they're stuck in the middle of nowhere Soviet Union, and for the next three years, 90% of the German deaths take place facing the Soviets, not America and Great Britain. 
So almost every German that dies between 1941, 42, and 1945 is dying on the Eastern Front facing the Soviets. They don't put that in American movies. It's not quite as sexy as, as Pearl Harbor and D-Day and fun things. But the real reason that Germans lose in Europe is because of the Soviet Union. Now, as I talked about yesterday, that War Powers Act in 1941 gives FDR full authority to direct the war effort. It's almost dictatorial, which was the critique of his during the New Deal. So during the war, he had control of trade, control of defense contracts, which means who we're buying tanks from, who we're buying planes from, American companies wise. Full control of censorship. In 1942, the War Powers Act gives him more power to take property, to take over property because it's war, to do rationing, to regulate transportation, to take over railroads, to make sure that the economy and society was functioning at full war effort. It gives him full power to draft and force men into the army. 15 million men are drafted by the end of the war. 350,000 women volunteer for, for military service, not in armed combat, but supporting the military with things like we saw in those posters yesterday, packing parachutes, flying transportation planes across the U.S., supporting the war effort on the home front. So it's important that we understand how this is a total war. As you guys saw yesterday in class, there is a significant amount of propaganda, which is all put out by the Office of War Information that Val pointed out earlier, these new offices that control people's opinions. They control the info of the war. Americans see and hear more war news than ever. This is a new, it's going to become a continuity of Americans seeing war footage on TV. But the government is going to restrict the reports of how many people die, who died, what they died from, and any pictures or video footage of people dying, they're not going to let people see. It's not until the Vietnam War that people start seeing the actual carnage that comes with the war. It's one of the reasons that there's no public opinion for the Vietnam War. They use the press, they use movies, they use celebrities, they use du Donald Duck, they use radio to build public morale, and they keep playing up the Axis nations as barbaristic. Very, very important. So now we're not just fighting the Nazis, we're fighting these animals, these war criminals. We're not just fighting the Japanese, we're fighting these militaristic, imperialistic, Pearl Harbor bombing beasts. What's the one Disney character they never use in propaganda? Mickey Mouse. Because I mean, he's too much of a, a loved figure in the U.S. They didn't want to tarnish. Well, Disney's like, cool, you can use my whole studio, all my character, you can use everything. You're not judging my husband, Mickey Mouse. <laughs> you can use my, my actual wife if you want. Uh, so we see, of course, different views of women in wartime, which reinforces what women are supposed to do. Do this. Don't do this, right? Don't talk about what your husband's doing or your boyfriend's doing or your, don't talk about anything. Don't talk about your work. Just go to work in the factory, grow a victory garden, and shut the hell up. Uh, I want to stop here for a second and let you chat about it. It's kind of hard to read. I'm sorry. It comes out of one of my document books. It says, Mother, when will you be home again? Some jubilant day, Mother will be home again doing the job she loves best, making a home for you and daddy when he is back. Take 30 seconds, what does that imply about women's role in the war? And maybe their role after the war. 30 seconds, what does that imply? All right, we we'll stop here. Uh, Miss Sandoval, what does this piece of propaganda imply about women's role during the war and after the war? That's fine. Yolanda, what do you think? Women have become more involved, sure, but what, Steph? Uh, 
Um, they leave them behind their children, but they're taking like the role of the male figure since they're at war, and she's mm -hmm. taking over the house and what a male figure is supposed to be doing. Sure, but what, Carla? Sometimes that their service is only temporary. Their service is only temporary. It says, so, some jubilant day, mother will be home again doing the job she loves best. I will bring that up now because that's the 1950s in a nutshell for next unit. Women are like, cool, we did our job, we did what we had to do. And women happily return to the domestic sphere and enjoy the prosperity of the post-war world before things start ticking in their head that says, like, wait, this isn't quite what I thought it was now that I've seen something else. For women as a, as a whole. So there's this implication that women are serving now, they're leaving the home now, they're not at home raising kids now, but soon they'll be back. That all this w progress for women, economically speaking, is just temporary. And soon they'll be back in the domestic sphere. But that's a real seesaw for women throughout history. Right? Republican motherhood, cult of domesticity, lol girls back in the house. Right? Seneca Falls, Gilded Age, stay home, get educated, mind your own business. So there's this seesaw forever for women. And the same thing happens in World War II, but I'd argue it's the bigger seesaw. The most progress economically, and then they put themselves happily back into the domestic sphere in the 1950s. Nice little preview for the start of period A. Cool. So really, it's a production miracle the way the U.S. runs World War II. Almost all civilian productions converted to war production. Here we see women packing missiles. Or bullets, whatever the hell these things are. I'm not in the military. <laughs> what are they? Just kidding, I don't care! 33% <laughs> of our economy as a whole is devoted directly to the war. This invigorates our domestic economy because of military spending, and the U.S. ends up making more weapons than all Axis powers combined. The U.S., despite entering the war later, makes more weapons than Japan, Germany, Italy, all together. The time shrinks. That's the real miracle. What used to take a month, now is going to take two weeks, and by the end of the war, it's going to take seven days. What used to take six months to make it destroy your ship, a huge ship, used to be a year, down to six months, down to three months. So by all this manpower, all this spending, all this innovation, and converting what was consumer production assembly line-wise to military production, just shrinks production times down to basically nothing. Now, in the Atlantic theater, the turning points that you should know are the Battle of Stalingrad, which is the high point of the German invasion into the Soviet Union. That is where the Germans finally suffer their first real defeat over land. They are turned back at that point, and they never again get that far into the Soviet Union. Big turning point, 1942, it's a long siege in the city of Stalingrad. The U.S. finally turns and opens a second front for the Germans to fight on. Because at this point, the Germans have taken over all of mainland Europe, and they are fighting a one-front war. The U.S. and the British attack through North Africa, what is called Operation Torch, which at least forces the Nazis to fight here and here in southern Europe and North Africa. Stalin is pissed. Stalin is pissed. Stalin is really pissed. Because Stalin is sitting here like, guys, 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 I'm the only ones fighting the Nazis over here. Can I get a little help? And America is telling him, just hold on. Just hold on. Just be a little patient. He's like, I can't be patient. We're going to die. He's like, fine, you have like 7 billion people. Just send some more people out there and die. It's fine. No big deal. Um, he wants the... Allies to open a second front here in Germany. They realize this is not a good idea, so they do it up through North Africa. He's still not happy because he thinks there's too much pressure on him and his people. He's not wrong, but it ends up being a good strategy. Um, by 1943, they are undertaking what's called Operation Avalanche, which is attacking what's seen as the soft, weak underbelly of the Axis through Italy. The Italians get invaded, and they quit like three months later. Like, we're done here. This is the, we don't want this. Like, yeah, you did. You signed up to fight a war with Hitler. This is exactly what you want. So that gets the Italians out. By June of 1944, we have our very famous D-Day invasion of the coast of Normandy of France, which opens a third front against the Germans. It's very successful. It's a huge undertaking. I'd love to go further into it. 
that we've mattered more to our curriculum, but it's quite impressive in terms of US capacity and industrial undertaking. By mid to late 44, Hitler has his last counteroffensive in the Battle of the Bulge at the tail, the, the boundary of Germany, which Hitler loses, and then it's a race to Berlin. By May of 1945, the Soviets have entered Berlin. The Allied forces of the British and the Americans are shortly thereafter. Hitler kills himself, and the battle in Europe is over. Now, unfortunately, on the way, they're discovering in Germany, in Poland, the Holocaust. So on the way, they're discovering these camps that are quite clearly laid out to exterminate people. And as the war ends, and then shortly after the war ends, more and more and more of this comes out, but it's quite unfortunate. I'll give you a second to get caught up there. kills himself because he lost the war and he realizes that everything he's about to get exposed is the real terror. In the Pacific, it's a little different. In the Pacific, it's a little different. Um, the Battle of Midway is the huge turning point there. Midway is here. The Germans, uh, the Germans, the Germans are over here. They're a little busy here. The Japanese are trying to re-attack Hawaii. We're taking the, battle, the Midway Islands first. The U.S. intercepts and cracks their code. They know what's coming. And that's the, the version of that Stalingrad battle of the turning points. First time the Japanese lose in the ocean at sea. Battle of Midway turns things back. And then the U.S. undertakes a strategy that's very important called island hopping. They're going to take one island at a time and then use that as a launch point for the next island. Right? It's like, like a frog on lily pads. Like You have to one lily pad and then you wait and then jump to the next one and the next one. Eventually you're on the land. So the idea is, over time, we're going to come back and retake the Philippines. And then retake these islands in the South China Sea. And eventually, it will be close enough to just strike at Japan's mainland. A couple very important battles. The Battle of Guadalcanal, which is a six-month battle down here in the Philippines. The Battle of Late Gulf in October 1944 is the first time we see the Japanese using kamikaze pilots. Question for you. Do you guys know what kamikaze pilots are? Yeah. I'm going to take my plane, I'm going to fly it into your boat and sink it. Die in the process. The original suicide bomber. Question. Why do kamikaze pilots wear seatbelts? Why do they wear helmets? It's something that I've always thought about since I was a kid. They're going to die anyway. Never mind. So, um, the Battle of Iwo Jima is very famous. It has that, that famous monument in Washington, D.C. of the two Marines putting the flag up. The hard-fought island, again, closer and closer and closer to Japan. By April of 1945, the U.S. has taken the island of Okinawa, right off the coast of Japan. And the Japanese still have not surrendered. Fun fact, or not so fun fact, uh, the U.S. still has a Marine base to this day in 2018 on Okinawa, right off the coast of Japan. Reminded them, hey, don't get crazy. We got brains here. Remember last time? Never mind. So, uh, very important to understand like the way in which the U.S. undertakes this. Only reason this is successful is we have more people, we have more resources, we have more money, we have more time. So by the time we get to Okinawa, we can now bomb mainland Japan. What's happening in Germany this whole time is bombing of civilian cities because they're not giving up, they've given up. Now we're doing the same thing to Japan. So whether you think this is right or wrong is not the point yet. But in 1945, the U.S. begins to target people in order to get the Japanese to surrender. 66 major Japanese cities are attacked. The bombings in Tokyo are actually more deadly than the atomic bombs. Over 500,000 civilians are killed. It's a lot of people, but is there such thing as a civilian in a militaristic country like Japan in a total war? That's for you to interpret. If you're, if you're working in a military factory, are you a civilian? By definition, yes. But you're supporting the war effort, so are 
It's a gray area. That's all I'm saying. The Battle of Lake Gulf, like I told you, leads to a full blockade of Japan, so they can't get anything in or out. So we're going to try to anaconda plan them. Their navy is virtually destroyed, and it's when they begin using kamikaze pilots because they have nothing else to fight with. But in the Japanese culture, there's no giving up, and they are not giving up. Nonsense. No, it's real. I'll fight her. You're going to fight her? Yeah. Don't do that. She's a nice lady. <laughs> Come see me tomorrow. Okay. Uh, in the Battle of Okinawa, all 110,000 Japanese soldier defenders are killed because they do not believe in surrender, so they all die instead. And now we, now we have two options. Keep bombing Japan or invade Japan. But if this is any indication... What's going to happen if we invade Japan? People will die. Thank you, Ramos. <laughs> if not one soldier in Okinawa, which is right off the coast of Japan, surrenders, they all die instead, then what are our options? Is this implication in Japanese culture, this samurai culture, that if that you, don't, you don't surrender, you win or you die? So the worry is if we're going to invade Japan, it's going to have huge casualties on both sides because... They're not going to surrender. Enter plan B. The last couple years of the war, FDR had been privately, secretly, super, super top secretly funding the Manhattan Project to split the atom and therefore create, harness the power of atoms and, and create the atomic bomb. Dr. Robert Oppenheimer successfully tested in 1945, but FDR's dead. FDR finally dies on April 12th, 1945, and right a couple months into his fourth term. And now Harry S. Truman is president. Say that fast. What you call him? <laughs> Got you. What does the S stand for? Nothing. He doesn't have a middle name. So he chose to just put S in his name. Because he'd sound more sophisticated, not realizing he sounds like Harry Ash Truman. <laughs> you know? American history. Sometimes the jokes just write themselves. <laughs> the estimate, conservatively speaking, is at least 350,000 American soldiers would die if you invade Japan. Whose life is worth more, an American life or a Japanese life? Neither life is worth more. Or ask Mr. Bush. All life is worth it. <laughs> however, however, in a war, you have to make decisions that benefit your country over the other one. The U.S. begins dropping pamphlets that say to the Japanese, like, surrender or imminent death will come. And the Japanese are like, never! <laughs> at one of the wartime conferences you look at in a minute, the Japanese are warned, like, hey, you should probably surrender. And they say no. So the decision is made by Harry Ash Truman. August 6th of 1945, the airplane, the Enola Gay, drops the first ever atomic bomb on Hiroshima. It kills 140,000 people on the spot. Tens of thousands more are injured. It causes radiation sickness that kills a generation with cancer and other terrible diseases that are related to radiation from the bomb. And 80% of the buildings in the city are destroyed. Flattened. And Japan still doesn't give up. Which goes to show this, this mentality of, of you could argue, I'm not, I'm, it's not my opinion to be had, but you could argue that that mentality is why you couldn't invade Japan in the first place. The fact that you drop an atomic bomb on them and they still don't surrender. They don't surrender, so three days later the U.S. does the same thing to Nagasaki, this time killing 70,000 people. So with two bombs, there are over 200,000 people dead, and 60,000 are injured. They still don't surrender, and the U.S. says, we have a third bomb. We'll do it again. The U.S. doesn't have a third bomb, but they will in about three weeks. It's about three to four weeks away from final production. These things are hard to make. Finally, five days later, Emperor Hirohito surrenders, which is called a Victory in Japan Day. The formal surrender is signed a couple uh, weeks later, according to USS Missouri, Tokyo Bay, and World War II is over.
All done. So the last couple of things that we look at is, is what comes next because of some wartime conferences and tension that you guys should remember from last year, but you probably don't because Montas. Uh, and then the cost of the war. What's the legacy? What's the cost? Now, the first conference you should know is in Tehran. This is where the U.S. agrees with Stalin to open this western front against Germany. Stalin wants the, the front to be opened in mainland Germany. The U.S. says, no, we'll use North Africa first. We'll get to Germany later. And they do, with D-Day. This is when the Soviet decides they're going to re-counter and invade eastern Germany. And they agree here that they're not going to stop fighting none of the countries involved until Germany has unconditional surrender. They're not going to let them surrender, kind of, and keep their country. No, we'll fight this war until Germany fully surrenders. In Yalta, a couple years later, they decide to split Germany up. Here's our first potential problem. But they say, they agree that any country that the, the Soviets have taken over in their process of invading Germany in Eastern Europe will have free elections. Let's go back to the map real quick. So all of these countries that the Soviets push through and therefore kind of take over in their way to Germany, all of these countries will have free elections after the war. What are free elections a symbol of? Democracy. Yeah, they'll be able to elect their own leaders, pick their own people, and Stalin says, yes, sure, absolutely, whatever the hell you want. The Soviet Union here also promises to join the U.S. in attacking Japan as soon as Germany's done. Here, Yalta is where the U.N. is created, this United Nations of, of big powers that will work together to keep the world safe. At Potsdam, which is right before the atomic bombs hit, Japan is told, give us your unconditional surrender. Give up, or you'll face prompt, speedy, and utter, complete destruction. What does Japan say? No. So the U.S. drops the bomb. This is here when they decide to occupy Germany and also split Berlin between the Soviets and the U.S., which is going to uh, preview some later problems. Here is where we see the laying out of the Nuremberg trials to put on war tribunal trials, the Germans who perpetrated the Holocaust, and put to death some of the German officials who were responsible for the Holocaust. And unfortunately, by this point, we are recognizing that the Polish government is going to be communist. So Poland, one of those Eastern European countries that the Soviets went through to get to Germany, is now a communist country. Here is also at Potsdam where we split Vietnam into North and South. We split Vietnam in the middle at North and South and give communist control of the North, capitalist control of the South. So this just shows some clear difference in opinion for what the world should look like after the war between the communist Soviets and us. And then Churchill's just sitting there chilling. He's old. So it just it, it uh, foreshadows some clear tension. All right. So costs: seventy million people die. Twenty-five million of them are military. Forty-five million of them are are uh, civilian. It's the first time ever in society and history where there's more civilian deaths than military deaths. It proves my point about it being total war. A lot of these civilian deaths are because of war crimes. The Holocaust. That Bataan Death March. The Nanking Massacre in China. So Japan and Germany both are guilty of atrocious war crimes, of killing of civilians in huge numbers, as is the U.S. You could argue that Nagasaki and Hiroshima are war crimes, except... The U.S. won. The U.S. itself has only 400,000 casualties, so a small percentage of everybody else, but the war costs the U.S. $360 billion. It's a lot of money. The 
war for other countries, Germany has three million combat deaths, three million soldiers die, but three quarters of those happen on the Eastern Front against the Soviets. Japan has one and a half million combat deaths, but they have almost a million civilians dead, all from US bombings. This is my point. 210,000 people die in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 700,000 die in other bombings. Tokyo gets firebombed every night. The city of Tokyo is almost burned down. Why is Tokyo such a great city now? It's all new and pretty? Because we burned it all down in World War II. <laughs> That's hilarious. It's one of the oldest cities in the world, and it's destroyed. So yeah, it's all nice and modern now, because they've only built it three back since 1945. When you include all deaths, World War II is the most destructive war in history. And 25 million of the deaths are Russian. The biggest chunk of deaths is Russian because of civilian deaths from starvation, because of all the fact that their soldiers are going out there throwing rocks at the Nazi war machine. And like I said, the U.S. spent over $300 billion, which is 10 times the previous of all other wars. It ends the Great Depression. That's good. And like I said, there is this many casualties of the U.S. One good thing that comes out of the war itself is the United Nations. Some hope is created. And unlike the League of Nations, the U.S. joins. There is a Security Council with five permanent members, the U.S., the Soviets, the British, the French, and China, all the anti-Axis powers. And they're going to have a vote, a veto-type powerful vote forever on this idea of an international peace council of countries to make sure this never happens again. Unlike World War I, there is no peace of Paris to reshape Europe. It all comes out of those conferences that I talked about. The key being Yalta, which is agreement to, to split up the, the European world politically, and then Potsdam, in which Roosevelt is dead, and Truman is there, and Stalin doesn't really respect Truman, and uh, he takes some actions to try to take more control than he might have taken otherwise. So the reality is Europe was politically cut in half after the war. Cut in half. The Soviet troops have overrun Eastern Europe. The American troops have overrun Western Europe. And Stalin, immediately before the war is even over, we're, start, we're still fighting Japan. Stalin is occupying Southeast Europe with Soviet troops, working on Poland, turning Poland communist, and then Roosevelt dies. Roosevelt's busy and the US is busy still fighting Japan and Stalin is doing his best to take full control of Eastern Europe which gives us our Iron Curtain later. It's a good little preview for your day. US instead, we already talked about this, our budget soars, our costs soar, we have full employment, everybody's working, governor, government spending soars, and therefore our US production soars as well. We are done shortly, so just hang tight with me. It ends the Great Depression. That's a huge turning point for the effect of the uh, war in U.S. society. Like I told you earlier, the Ford Motor Company is putting out one bomber plane per hour, which is insane. People save a bunch of money because of rationing. People don't spend money on themselves because they can't. The South has an economic boom because a lot of army bases are put in the South because it's warmer there. So the South finally has some semblance of progress, but it's all because of the army, who's serving the army, white people. And the national debt grows a ton. So those are some of the effects. But it's very important that all of this spending, all of this infrastructure, all of this funding is what ends the Great Depression. Excellent. All right, so you take a couple minutes, respond to that prompt, and we are done with period seven.